Um, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, thank you so much for joining us here. And as we heard in all of those statements from world leaders, we're looking at transformation, but we really have to be looking at the health of the nations, the wealth of the nations, and ultimately the health of people. Um, I'm very excited to be talking about this because uh, it's probably one of the most important factors that we really do need to be examining, we need to be looking at, and I'm absolutely delighted to have with me here the Chief Executive Officer of Reaching the Last Mile, Nassar Al Mubarak. Lovely to see you and thank you for being with us. And Simon Bland, the CEO of the uh, Global Institute for Defense uh, Disease Elimination. So when we look at the impact of the health sector on climate change, on the environment, it is, it's huge. But also we have to look then at the impact of the environment on health, on human health. And Simon, if I might start with you, we look at, I think, what we've been talking about for the last two days here, and every panel has talked about how important people are to the equation. Um, but I think a lot of people have probably gotten, maybe forgotten about around the world. And not everybody is sort of reaching ahead as fast as everyone else. And what's the danger of actually ignoring maybe sometimes or just maybe not noticing, um, but the health of the planet. And if we don't get that right, when we look at climate change, I think we're in trouble. What do you say? Give us a feel for where we are now. So thanks, Etna. Um, I mean, I think if you wanted to describe the situation, I'd say it's a little bit fragile right now, a little bit shaky. Um, the World Health Organization identifies climate change as a fundamental threat to human health and it threatens to reverse decades of progress. And it's clearly a, uh, a clear and present danger now, and that danger is, is escalating. And we see the impacts through direct heat-related deaths and illness. We see it through uh, air pollution and air quality. We see it through uh, water and food production. We see infectious diseases affected by this. We see extreme weather events. Um, uh, uh, and we see mental health consequences. So those impacts are, are, are clear and present and getting worse. But let me start by picking up from where Secretary Kerry spoke yesterday, which was about amazing progress that has been made. Um, over the last 120 years, human longevity has increased by 41 years. So we live 41 years longer on average than we did a, a century ago. Four million years prior to that saw a 12-year increase in life expectancy. So the impact of science, of research and development, of knowledge and of modern medicine has had a huge impact on humanity as we see it today. But the benefits of that progress are not evenly distributed and billions of people are left behind, as you say, are, are, are forgotten. And the progress that we have made has stalled already and that progress is fragile, and that progress is reversible. And it's reversible because of a number of threats, clearly climate change, antimicrobial resistance, uh, lack of investment, uh, uh, just neglect uh, of, of leaving behind. So what got us to the point of here is not going to get us to the future. Let me just finish with one quick example. In Pakistan in 2022, uh, there were devastating floods. It submerged one-third of the country. It killed almost 2,000 people. It made over 2 million people homeless. And the number of malaria cases increased by 50%, an extra million cases of malaria because of that. So we're seeing the effects of this every day. And again, you know, just as you referred to the floods there, that itself is devastating. But it's the damage it leaves behind, maybe, that's the silent damage that nobody's paying attention to as well, that we need to be looking at. Nassar, come in here and talk to us. You know, we see the urgency, or we should see it, maybe a little bit clearer, and, you know, the importance of getting it right. But there's still many obstacles to actually just getting this and, and making sure that we can eradicate some of these almost unnecessary diseases. Absolutely. Um, so maybe we'll start with some of these obstacles. And I think it's important to give the audience a bit more context and just to remind people that Half of the world's uh, population, and that's around 4 billion people, live with uh, no or basic access to uh, even the most rudimentary health services. And uh, unfortunately, when you take that fact and you couple it with um, that these are the same communities that are on the front lines of climate change, uh, we can very quickly see that it's an enormous concern. Uh, as Simon just shared, uh, climate change is affecting disease patterns and increasing the risks of outbreaks. And um, 
I'm sorry to mention this word, uh, but COVID-19 uh, reminded us that... It did, well, yes, it did. I mean, yeah. that's the reality. You're right. Absolutely. It uh, reminded us that diseases uh, don't respect uh, boundaries, and it's why uh, really global health uh, challenges require global solutions, and why it behooves us all to work together to address them. Uh, we know that the climate crisis is, in fact, a health crisis, and that the health of our planet and our health are intertwined. And while that's a huge challenge, I also think it's a generational opportunity for us. It means that uh, climate mitigation in all its forms, whether that be uh, cleaner energy or sustainable food systems, directly will affect human health. At reaching the last mile, we also uh, believe that the best defense against the effects of uh, climate change are strong, resilient health systems. As Simon just mentioned, uh, whether we look at the floods in, in Pakistan in 2022 or the fatal uh, heat waves that we've seen from Bangladesh to across uh, the world, is that the incidence of diseases spike uh, up uh, drastically when, when faced with some of these shocks. And uh, I mean, to probably close, I would say that the, the way to address this is really to invest in resilience across all its forms, as we heard from the, the uh, the president uh, earlier on, uh, investing in resilience helps ensure that healthcare remains available to everyone, even vulnerable communities, uh, in the face of climate shocks. Simon, come back to that. You know, um, obviously, vulnerable communities are where we have to look at, because I think in the developed world, we sometimes don't see it, and maybe we turned a blind eye to it. Uh, Nassar just mentioned there, as he said, the climate crisis is a health crisis, and you know, because it's not you know, in our face every day, I suppose, and it's not making headlines, that's the other danger, the media probably needs to pay a bit more attention. You know, what can we really do or what is being done to actually help, I suppose, elevate the problem to a point where we see it and we're maybe disgusted enough to actually take action and do something? Because I think that's what's lacking sometimes. So I, I think we have a real challenge and at, at risk of preaching to the choir. I mean, yeah. sometimes it, it's about finding different audiences and making compelling arguments and, and being prepared to listen to counter arguments and, and, and figure that through. And I don't think we've been particularly good at that. As I say, I think there has been great progress. There's been great international investment in global health. Um, that, that has stalled and we've seen the progress that that, that, that has, has, has yielded. Um, Nassar reminds us of, 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 of COVID-19. Um, parasites, mosquitoes, diseases don't carry passports, don't respect boundaries. And so my health is your health and your health is my health and our health is their health and their health is our health. So we are in this together, although sometimes we don't naturally see that and, you know, and think that. So I think what does need to happen, I do think we have some political headwinds and we have these technological tailwinds behind us and we need to sort of sort of change the balance and think about about that technology but i think about investment and i think about the the climate activists and the energy transition uh, uh, specialists that we have here and i think about nationally determined contributions and do you know that less than one percent of nationally determined contributions is invested in health and and we have to integrate our health expenditure our education expenditure our energy expenditure and our sustainability transition expenditures together. So I think we need more visibility for health than we have right now. You know, I think in all of the panels, we like to talk about sort of initiatives and investment. But sadly, sometimes when it comes to health, we have to, we're actually really looking at deaths, real life, you know, the situation and, and, and the dollars. And, you know, the, the people lost, the dollars lost. Nassar, talk to me here. The World Health Organization is saying that by 2050, that just the, co the cost of health um, related diseases is going to be about 15, um, no, more than 12 trillion, trillion dollars. And we're probably going to be looking at 15 million deaths. These are staggering figures that shouldn't have to happen. Again, come back to it. How do you think we can get access to health care, you know, for particularly for people when it is related to climate change? I mean, the, the simple answer, I think, is that we need to ensure that health is at the heart of the global climate agenda. And that's the only way that we will ensure that it receives the focus and financing it requires. And uh, to point to uh, how that works, I think a good example was during COP28, where it was the first time that we saw a dedicated health day as part of COP. 
and that produced the first declaration uh, on climate and health, which was endorsed by over 144 countries. And uh, that will likely continue, so the fact it started here was very uh, important. We're happy that we, we played part of, uh, in that legacy. Uh, but more tangibly, I think, it mobilized a billion dollars in climate health financing. Yes. Now, COP28 also made two points very clear to all of us. One is that we need more funding. Uh, health still only attracts a fraction of overall uh, climate funding. And it's even more difficult for communities at risk to access that finance. Second, I think, and this is maybe an inconvenient truth to many of us, but we still need data. Uh, we don't really know enough about how climate change affects health uh, or what interventions we should prioritize to have the most impact in a resource-constrained environment. At reaching the last mile, we know that uh, philanthropic capital uh, does have the distinct ability, though, to move quickly and take a bit more risks, uh, and then crowd in other actors once we are able to demonstrate uh, success. So over the course of the last couple of years or so, we've been working on investing in building that database. Um, and uh, I mean, just uh, over the course of the next couple of weeks, uh, alongside our uh, colleagues at the Rockefeller Foundation and Foundation S, we'll be launching a landmark analysis of uh, climate health financing okay. uh, to really help direct and shape uh, global priorities when it comes to that nexus. Uh, in parallel, we're also working, I mean, you mentioned earlier the WHO, we're working with them to better understand how changing uh, weather uh, data patterns uh, affect diseases like malaria. Um, but the... To, to, to simplify, I think through all of this, we can understand how to safeguard better global health progress. Uh, we need to make sure that the gains we've uh, already made, we can sustain them. And we need to make uh, sure that we're able to promote a more equitable access going forward. Yeah, because I mean, there, there are, it is progress has been made. And you know, for what you're doing at reaching the last mile, and you should all look at reaching the last mile. It's, it's very, very impressive indeed to see the work that you are doing. So more work like this is absolutely to be encouraged. Um, Simon, briefly touch on technology for me, because this is a conference where I think we started off with the possibilities of AI and technology and how everything is just moving at such a fast rate. Surely technology should be able to help us on the health side as well. Uh, and it plays a massive role already. Um, uh, we heard President Kagame yesterday talking about Zipline, um, uh, this uh, drone technology for moving blood samples and, and, and medicines. There's a saying in global health, which is if you stand still, you go backwards. Because if you stand still, the microbes evolve, you get resistance. So we have to have this constant race with, uh, you know, with, with, with pathogens. Um, we, uh, for our own Falcon Awards, have supported some drone mapping of breeding sites for, for mosquitoes uh, in Peru. It's happening in Malawi. It's happening in Zanzibar. Drones are being used for spraying. We have new vaccines. We have new medicines. AI helping with the discovery of molecules, shortcutting the circuit from discovery to research and development of, 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 of new therapies, uh, genetic modifications of mosquitoes. So technology is at the heart of the progress. It has been over that last 120 years that has got us here, and it's clearly going to be a huge part of taking us to the, through the next century. And Nassar, technology can't be just in this country or in the developed world, that has to be shared, but that comes down to international cooperation because this is a global problem. We need somehow to find a global solution, don't we? Absolutely, and I think the, the challenge uh, is uh, that climate change and human health are not something that we can solve all alone, as, as we clearly understand. And we, um, as a community, need a shared blueprint for action that's driven by the needs of countries on the forefront. Um, I think it's through the knowledge and expertise that we will learn, then we can really develop the technologies uh, that uh, we uh, really require. And uh, to offer just an example of that, uh, we uh, at Reaching the Last Mile have been uh, privileged to work with our colleagues at G42 and the Mohammed bin Zayed University for AI uh, in, many, uh, in many sort of issues that hopefully will drive progress uh, using technologies. So you're bringing in the best expertise in there as well. Yes, yes. yes absolutely. And, um, I mean, maybe I'll offer one example. We're working on a program called Forecasting Healthy Futures okay. uh, with, uh, as well, uh, Malaria No More and the university, which basically harnesses uh, AI technology and weather data to find ways to uh, combat uh, climate change. And one of the projects is actually a digital toolkit okay. uh, that helps countries predict better uh, and stop malaria outbreaks before they even happen. Uh, we started the pilot program in Odisha State in India 
where the toolkit, uh, as well, combined with other interventions, I mean, we all know there's no one silver bullet, has uh, reduced uh, uh, malaria incidence in 81% in that region. But beyond global health, I think the UAE has done a lot in, uh, in uh, demonstrating the role of technology, whether we're talking about AI-led yes. agricultural innovation, or, uh, I mean, uh, uh, companies like Altera. The UAE is showing that just as the challenge of uh, climate change is increasing, so are the potential solutions. And um, we have to, to wrap it up. Nassar, stay with us and just give us, I suppose, a closing. If there was a call to action for what people can do, um, you know, because there's a lot that we need to do in the future, but actually we need to also, you know, move fast on this. What would you want that to be? Sure. So I think, I mean, to wrap up, I would just like to reiterate the message that uh, the climate change is the defining health challenge of our time. They're not uh, separate issues. They're, they're, they're one. It's not a future threat. It's one that we face today. But the extent of which current and future generations will be impacted do uh, are basically on what we, we decide collectively uh, to do. We can change the trajectory of that through investments, actions, and partnerships we create together. Uh, and I think it's very important that uh, we don't take solutions uh, that are conceived in the global north and impose them on the global south. We need to work together. Uh, and, and really address these issues collectively. Yeah, you're, you're so right. I mean, I think we have to just think a little bit wider. I'll leave you the closing word on this one, Simon. Again, what needs to be done fast? What do you see? You've been in this business and watching this, you know, and seeing it evolve around the world for a long time. What can we really do? What's necessary? So I think we, we keep doing a lot of what we're doing. I, I'm, I, I mean, on, on technology, I, I did want to give you that example of... Uh, we, we've recently witnessed the passing of former President Jimmy Carter, his yeah. relationship with the founding father of, of this country yeah. and what they did in Guinea worm is amazing. Three and a half million cases to seven last year with no massive technology, but innovations, a little bamboo drinking straw. Um, so human ingenuity, I'd, I'd finish off with where you started, people. Put people at the center of this and put vulnerable communities at the center of this and make them part of the planning process and design process for better health for their community, for their countries, for their regions and for our planet. Thank you for that. And again, I mean, I think it brings it back down to, you know, uh, you know, the, the health of the people is the, the wealth of the people or the wealth of the nations and it moves to the economic progress. If we don't get that right. Sadly, nothing's going to work. You know, we have to we have to look at ourselves, look at our neighbors, look at our uh, colleagues and people in right around the world and make sure that we make we make this make it work gentlemen thank you so much um, Nassar Al Mubarak thank you for joining us from uh, reaching the last mile and Simon Bland um, again both of you gentlemen thank you so much thanks for thank putting you. this in perspective with us thank you